Well, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and when I was thinking about the whole sermon series uh, in 1 Timothy, one of the main reasons, one of the primary uh, portions of the text that I wanted to look at when I was thinking about this last year was this issue of contentment. I was like, this is something that we need to talk about in our culture today, in our society, and in our churches as well. And here's the truth. A misdiagnosed problem produces a wrong solution. A misdiagnosed problem will produce a wrong solution. And I feel like that we often misdiagnose the problem as it relates to contentment. I think discontentment is a stronghold in our country today. I think discontentment is a stronghold. And at the same time, there is a place for holy discontentment. That's completely biblical. There are times where we should be wholly discontent. You can think of the Bible. Remember David, when he walked out onto the field and he saw Goliath, and Goliath was taunting the gods, or taunting the armies of Israel, and David was discontent. He's like, this is not good. I can't tolerate this. And he shut him up. And then you got Ruth. Remember after her husband died and Naomi was like, releases her to go, and she's like, no, I'm... I won't be content to abandon you. And she stays with her mother-in-law. Or Nehemiah, in Nehemiah's story, he was discontent that the walls of Jerusalem had not been rebuilt. They were still destroyed. And he's like not happy and he has a holy discontent for what's happening in the world around him because God's glory was at stake. And anytime you have a holy discontent, and I hope we do have a holy discontent, then there should be a place where we proceed with prayer, a step of faith, and we experience God do a work in our lives. And that always happens. In all those situations, there was prayer, a step of faith, and personal growth when the holy moment took place. A holy discontent is a glorious thing. That is not what I'm talking about this morning. <laughs> I'm talking about the unholy discontentment that often plagues us and the apathy that's very evident in our society and often in our culture. Some recent statistics, just doing a study, a 2023 last year's Gallup poll revealed that Americans are unhappier at work than they've ever been in the past. The Wall Street Journal also posted a report last year in 2023 that despite of wages increasing for many people, more paid time off than before, more control over about where we work. We have greater flexibility than we used to have in years past. That in light of all those changes that workers are angrier, stressed, and disengaged from their work more than any other time. It's interesting. So in other words, there's evidence that suggests that we have more money than before, more free time than we've had before, there's more labor-reducing technology to make things easier on us than ever before in history, and we are less content than any other people in history. And here's the myth that I think a lot of us buy into, and this is why misdiagnosing the problem leads to the wrong solution, is that most of us think that if our circumstances change, then we would be content. That the issue is one of circumstances. And I would argue that that is not the right problem. It's a misdiagnosed problem. To think that contentment would come if your circumstances change. And we could probably test ourselves and, and discover that we all kind of buy into this myth a little bit, right? If I sat around and said, how much money would it take for you to feel like you have enough? I bet it's gonna be more than you currently have for most people. Or how much time do you need? Or how much? It's gonna be more, more, more. I need more in order to feel content, right? If my circumstances would only change, I could experience contentment. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter six. I'm gonna start at verse three. It says this. This is Paul talking, telling Timothy this. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instructions of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. 
They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words which result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth, who think godliness is a means of financial gain. Let me pause for just a second. Remember there was false teachers um, that were here that were telling people things that they want to hear. And people were interested in hearing these things. Paul had came in and preached earlier, but Paul here is exposing their motives. If you, if you think about what these teachers want, these are teachers that are thinking that if I have influence over this people in this city in Ephesus, and if I do ministry here in Ephesus, I could become rich and famous. They were focusing on what they could get from people. And what's interesting is there's still a connection with false teachers today. There's one of the indicators of someone's a false teacher is what's their motives. If it's a bigger, house, more stuff, I just want to see what I can get from the people. And they tell people what they want to hear so they can get wealthy and more stuff. Paul is exposing that as a wrong motive for teachers. So he says that, and then he picks up again in verse uh, six. And by the way, just also to clarify, I think it's interesting that there is a connection with false teachers who would use their platform to get rich. If using your platform to get rich is the metric to measure success, then Jesus was a failure. But that is not the metric. Verse six, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So just to summarize, again, Paul taught in Ephesus for over two years. He teaches sound doctrine. He plants a church. They're growing in their faith. He takes off. Some false teaching starts taking place. He gets word. He hears about it. He sends Timothy a letter. He's like, here, Timothy, I, want you, I need you to lead. That's what the letter of 1 Timothy is about, him leading in Ephesus. And he wants them to recognize there's people in this church that are teaching things. Even though they're things that people want to hear, they're not good things. And he gives them indicators. There's three things throughout the book that he mentions. If the teaching is contrary to sound doctrine, that's a red flag. If the, te if the motives of the speakers are just the wealth and what, what I can get from others. If it's selfish motives, that's a red flag. And if the content only quit, creates quarrels and disputes, circles that don't go anywhere and it's not building and edi edifying the church, then that's a red flag. He's like sound teaching. It keeps the focus on Christ. The motives are out of humility and God's glory and it builds up the church. And so he exposes these false teachers here. But let me talk about money just again for a minute because it's very important to understand that the issue is not money itself in this. Money is not the root of evil. It is the love of money. You get that? There's a difference. It's not saying money is bad. It is when we love it. It could be like, like Oxycontin. Is Oxy bad? Well, not necessarily. It's, but if you love Oxy and you're living for Oxy, then it's gonna lead you to a bad place, right? If people, and maybe that's not the best analogy to use, but, but there's, the, the point is, it's not saying that money is a bad thing here. It's saying that when people love, when, it's the, when their life is propped up against what they can get, and their motives are what they can get, and it's all about the love of money, I gotta have more, I gotta have more, that is the problem. Money itself is not the issue. It's the love of money. Hebrews 13, five says it this way. Keep your life free, I like the word play, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. So he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, this is a trust issue. It's interesting here. I hope I got some, some money in my wallet. So if you look here, I think that it's ironic. Here's a $10 bill. You know what's on the back of the $10 bill as well as on a $1 bill? as well as on a $50 bill, are your U.S. currency, in God we trust. Isn't that ironic that it says in God we trust on one of the objects that we are most likely to replace 
our devotion to instead of God? Often the bigger idol in our life is the very currency in which in God we trust is printed. Now, it's interesting. So if I got up here and I said, so what you need to do is you can make more money because there's reminders on every dollar in God we trust. And the more money you have, the more you're reminded of how you can trust God. That sounds good, right? <laughs> That would be false teaching. That's kind of like what's going on here. I could tell people what they want to hear. They'll, they'll, they'll enjoy it, but it'll have a spin on it. It won't bring anything good to their life. And it's, it was deceptive. And that was the issue. And the cure for greed's disease in our life is trusting in God's provision. The cure for greed's disease in our life is trusting in God's provision. When we replace trusting in God's provision with our own ability, our own means, we're going to trust in our finances over God's provision, and that's where we get in trouble. So let me give you the outline of what I want to do with my remainder, remainder, remainder of my time. I want to talk about a pathway to discontentment that I think many of us walk without realizing it, with the best of intentions. So I want to talk about the pathway to discontentment. I'm going to talk about a pathway to contentment. And then I want to highlight three traps or that, that we can often slip into when we follow that pathway of discontentment. So contentment has nothing to do with material possession for most of us. It has everything to do with our thinking. It's an issue of the heart. In other words, it doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor or you're here, you could still struggle with contentment or discontentment. Your material stuff is irrelevant to the application of this message this morning. This is not a message for rich and wealthy people over poor people. Discontentment can hit everybody in different places, and we need to be aware of that. So here is the success ethic that I think most of us have. This is a, a pathway to discontentment. You ready? It's this. Having, being, doing. Or having, doing, being, sorry. Having, doing, being. So it says this, and I'm gonna quote Brandon Dawson. I was reading uh, a book of his this year, and it, and it says this in the book, to quote him. We believe that having what we want will enable us to do the things that we wanna do and therefore help us be the person we want to be, a happy person. And here, here's the problem with this, and this is, I think, what most people do. In this Progression, our identity is propped up against what we do. And I'm, I'm trying to do something so that I can be the person I want to be. And again, this sounds good. And, and there, here's the problem. Here's the problem with it. The problem is, is you don't enjoy what you have today because you're only focusing on what you're going to get tomorrow, which are the things you don't have today. Catch the mindset of that? If I'm trying to do something in order to be someone, then I'm always forward thinking and I'm never living in my moments and I'm always wanting what I don't have, thinking about what I don't have. Let me give you an example. You're, say, you're a college student and you want to go to med school. And you're like, all right, I need to have the right degree in order to do what I want to do. I need to have a degree if I'm going to help people. I want to be a good doctor. And so you start going to med school and you start doing all the hard work. And the whole time, it's difficult, but you're like, I want to be a good doctor someday. And then when you finally graduate and you got all that student loan stuff, you got to start paying off that and dealing with all that stuff. But you're still looking to who you're going to be. But by the time you get that far, that many years of working hard, you never feel like you're enough. You've programmed yourself to try to be this person, this doctor, and you get tired and frustrated in your pursuits so that by the time you are a doctor and you've got your own business, it always feels like something's missing because you've trained your mind to think, I need to do in order to be. There's a good reminder that many of you probably remember and it's been used by a lot of preachers over the years where Tom Brady, remember the 60-minute interview back in 2005 when he'd only won three Super Bowls before he won seven? And he made the comment that uh, there's got to be more than this. There's a sense that he was at the top of his game, won the Super Bowl, MVP, and yet he felt like it wasn't enough. He was programmed to feel like, I need to have to do in order to be. And once he was there, he never felt like he could be enough. 
we're discontent with life because we're never being enough when our being is a result of our doing and we feel like we have to have in order to do, in order to be. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, let's flip the script and see what the path to contentment might look like. The path to contentment involves being so that you can do, so that you can have. You do things based on who you are. Your identity is not based on what others think of you, uh, nor your performance. That way, your joy is not based on external things, but internal. That's why if you, if you study the book of Ephesians, the whole first half is all about who you are in Christ, and the second half is about what you do. There's not a single command in chapters one through three, the first book. It's just understand who you are in Christ. You've been adopted. He's lavished his love upon you. You were once dead. You're now alive. It's understand who you are. This is who you are in Christ. This is your identity. This is your being. This is who you are in Christ. And then the second half is often, and this is what you do. This be angry and sin not. And, and, and you need to love your wife. And you need to do this. Put on the whole armor of God. Do this, do this, do this. Too often, though, we ignore the first three chapters and start looking at the to-do list in hopes that if you do these things, you can become this person in Christ. And it starts with out of identity. There's a difference. I'll talk a little more about this. Uh, we discover contentment when we recognize our doing is already based on who we are and will lead to the things that we have. So, for example, the person in med school if they go into med school feeling like I have a sense of calling, God has called me to help people and has given me a mind that I could, I could handle the schooling, and you go into med school saying, God, I, I, you've called me into this and I'm going to be a doctor, and then all through the process of your learning, you're still thanking God through that process. In other words, you're living for each day, not for what's going to happen eight years down the road, but every day there's a process of how can God use me in this moment? And what has he given me to do? And then you're thankful to God. And then when you get out of the other end of med school, you're far more likely to enjoy being on the other side of it because you've already had contentment in the process because your being was established not based on what you're gonna do in order to make you a good doctor. You, you felt God's called me to do this and I'm faithful steward of the things he's entrusted me. So the reason I'm doing is because I know my being already and then the things you have, you hold with a less, lesser grip because you recognize that that's what God has given you. And you have gratitude along the way because you're living each moment for the moment, not for future. And you're programming yourself to be grateful because you're not programming yourself for tomorrow with the things you don't have. You're embracing stewardship of the things you do have today. Paul talks about learning contentment this way. So let me look at Philippians 4 because if it doesn't make sense yet, Wait, I hope this will help make it sense. Uh, Philippians 4 says it this way. Philippians 4 verse 11, Paul is saying, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. So it's a learning process. Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength, referring to Christ. Paul's circumstances were irrelevant to his contentment. And he knew, he knew who he was in Christ. He knew the source of his strength was in Christ. And so his being was, I'm a child of God. His doing flowed out of, because I'm a child of God, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to live for God. And that way, when his having happened, and here's the thing, this is the, this is the part that won't sound good to some people. Sometimes his hat, it's the strength to do all things. All things means all things. It means whether I got, whether the circumstances are here or here, I can do all things because whatever I have, I'm trusting in God. Not the money that I think I need, not the future focus thing that I need, but my faith is in Christ. And I'm living different, but here's the thing. Notice this is still to be learned. Some things, in other words, some things you develop through understanding. There's light bulb moments. You're like, I didn't know that. Now that I know that, I could live completely different. This is not one of those things. This is more about discipline and application over time versus a light bulb moment. Paul 
acknowledge that he, was, he had to learn contentment through trials, through difficulty. It's still learned. It's a thought process. We, we program ourselves to be content when we reflect on I am enough in Christ and what others think of me is irrelevant to my identity. And then I do out of that place and then whatever I have, I'm grateful for. But it is a process of walking a path of contentment versus discontentment by being and, and doing and having. But again, uh, many of us will drift into this side. So hopefully that makes sense. I want to go back to verse 9. Verse 9 said this. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. I just want to talk about some of the harmful desires or traps that we can fall into, just like these people in Ephesus that, that can be destructive when we're on the path to discontentment. So here's some of those harmful desires, and you'll, you'll relate to some of these. One is the valuing wrong things. How many people uh, have, in some sense, became successful in the world's eyes only to have the testimony that they sacrificed the things that mattered most along the journey? They were so passionate about getting that, that seven and eight figure salary and all the, the wealth that they went through multiple marriages and their, the baggage with their kids won't talk to them and all this, they sacrificed the things that mattered most on the altar of their success because they were so, in, in all along the journey to them, they were doing it for their family, but they were the absent father or the absent mother. The situation is we can value the wrong things. We can become so focused on worldly things and, and future thinking that we miss out on opportunities today, being in the moment today. It's like, well, I'll just move on. The second one, uh, the comparison trap. A comparison is a thief of joy. We, we love to look at people who seemingly more successful than us in compares. Oh, they're, they're better looking. They have more stuff. They have, the grass is greener on the other side, and we reflect on the things that others have that we don't. But I think this is ironic. We, we do this, especially in, in America. However, how often do we reflect on or compare with others who have less? Why is it that we always compare with those who have more? I remember uh, we went to China in, well, in 2014, last time we went. And when I was uh, doing college ministry, I didn't make a lot of money. Uh, we had a family of four. We made, we made less than $40,000 a year. So we, we didn't have a lot of money by American standards. And our kids would sometimes say, uh, are we poor? <laughs> they would ask the question. Because they had friends that did more trips and they had nicer homes and nicer vehicles and stuff like that. And, and I used to tell our kids, you could ask my wife, talk to my kids, I would tell them that we were rich. I'm like, it just feels poor because we're in America. But by worldly standards, we're pretty wealthy. We have two cars, you know. We had a 97 Honda Civic and a 2000 Cavalier. I'm like, uh, we're rich. I, I, I honestly told our kids we were rich. And I wanted them to believe it. Uh, even though, again, we were making less than 40,000 a year. So we went to China, and they felt, finally felt rich. Were people who just had a bicycle. You have two cars, two vehicles? They would tell their friends, these are, these are rich people. We, we felt like rich people and perceived as rich people when we can begin to compare ourselves with those who had nothing. The problem is we don't do that, do we? We always compare ourselves to the people who have more, and so we feel like we need to get more stuff in order to live up to those expectations of those standards. And a good exercise, I'm like, I'd love to take my kids to uh, third world countries to help get perspective. And the truth is we need to go there sometimes in our own hearts and minds so we'd stop comparing ourselves with others who have more and maybe be more appreciative for what we do have when we think about others who have less. Comparison in general, though, can be, a, can be one of those pitfalls or traps but it's just important to think about. A third thing is externalizing blame. Some of you know people. 
In this world, everything else is someone else's fault, right? They never take accountability for their actions or their own suffering. They always perceive themselves to be the victim. We train ourselves on the path to discontentment when our, our doing in, influences what our being is, when we're propping our identity up against the things that we do in our performance, we have a tendency to protect that and blame others for anything that would jeopardize making us look weak. So if we're parenting, I'm a mature, level-headed adult, but my kids are the ones making me crazy. It's the kids' fault. I'm a nice person, generally, but my coworkers are such jerks that sometimes I just get angry. But it's the coworkers' fault because they're the ones who are the jerks. Or the reason I'm a struggling Christian is the pastor's fault. He's not preaching sermons that are good enough to help me grow in my faith. It's, it's somebody else's issue why you're not where you want to be or the reason you are where you are where it's not where you want to be. But you're always blame shifting. Cannot control someone else's actions, but you can control your reaction or your action. It's important to know that. Uh, and this is true. This is sad, but... Even the worst victims need to understand this because if the worst victims and people who have experienced most egregious sins against them, they still need to learn to forgive and take responsibility because if the mindset is continually blame shifting, they will never climb out of the right headspace they need to be happy in life and to feel like enough. Blame shifting does not help us get past where we, even if it's legitimate, but that is the path when we're down to discontentment. We have a tendency to do those things. Those are some of those. I was going to do a bigger list, but just three. Um, so here's the wrap up. A true person who's going to be content needs to follow that being, doing, having. And here's the other thing. I know that you could even be a non-Christian and you would be healthier if you had a sense of this is who I am and this is what I do and the things that I have, or they come out of that. However, if your identity is not in Christ, then being and doing and having could still take on a selfish direction. And we need to be more focused as believers on who we are in Christ. So being for the Christian needs to be rooted in our identity in Christ. Let me read a quote from a devotional book. And I think I only got part of this on here. I don't think I added all of it, but I'm going to read it. It might only have a third of this on the screen. The more self-centered our desires are, the more frustrated our response will be when those desires are blocked or denied. He went on to say, I don't think I have this. If our focus is purely on accomplishments of God's purposes, there will be little anger in our response to obstacles and delays simply because we know that nothing can ultimately block God's purpose from being achieved. In other words, there's a sense when we don't get what we want, we are unsatisfied and we're more likely to experience anger, fear, and anxiety and live in a state of frustration. But when we know that we're following God's plan and God's in control, we've already given that over to him in the being segment of who we are. So when we don't get what we want, it doesn't affect our identity. We're not as, we're not as likely to get angry and frustrated because we've given it to God and we're trusting in him. He's our provider. He will take care of us. It is a mindset, it is a process, it's a discipline that takes place, that needs cultivated, and my fear is the society and culture around us is telling us a different pathway, and we've bought into it hook, line, and sinker. So I wanna lead us in a prayer. So I'd ask you to take a moment, bow your heads. I wanna do a prayer of reflection, repentance, and commitment to Christ so that we can be his children do his work and have his presence, which results in contentment. Let's pray. Lord, at this moment, I would ask that you would search our hearts. And God, the things that came to our mind, perhaps the idols, the things that we're trusting in instead of you, and that you would remind us that you are enough as we would trust in you. Lord, forgive us for placing our faith in lesser things, giving our devotion to lesser things. Forgive us for trying to let our identity be based on what others think of us more so than what you say is true of us, that you love us, Lord, that you've adopted us, you've sealed us with your Holy Spirit, 
You've given us life. We're your workmanship in Christ Jesus, created for good works. And may we live life out of a heart of gratitude. Lord, help us to identify the work that we would do for your glory, the spiritual gifts you've given us, that we would live a life that honors you, and we would experience your presence, recognizing that you would never leave us or forsake us. We'd not walk away from your spirit, but we would abide in you and your words would abide in us. And we would have those holy moments, that we would have a holy discontentment. And Lord, that we would love you and walk in contentment of the things of this world, trusting that you will be our provider. We love you. We thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.